Section 1 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper the Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies, an exhibit of the capital, assets, and losses of the companies, together with a graphic account of the great disaster, accompanied by maps of Chicago showing the burn district. The Insurance Companies and the Chicago Fire Our Fire Insurance System the tremendous losses resulting from the Chicago fire, sustained by the insurance interest of the country, and the prompt settlement of those losses, so far as the companies have been able to meet their liabilities, while they bear testimony to the beneficent mission and great usefulness of this interest, must necessarily lead to greater caution and conservatism in its future management. It is a mere truism to say that the benefits of both fire and life insurance should be more widely distributed, but in order to accomplish this it will be necessary to proceed upon a basis which shall attract capital to the business of insurance, and render it profitable to the insurer as well as the insured. It is useless to expect that capital will flow into this channel from mere considerations of public utility and general benevolence. The men who own or represent capital are noted for their caution, and do not embark their means in extra-hazardous enterprises, unless their profits are commensurate with their risks. Though cheap insurance is certainly a desideratum for the general welfare, there is such a thing as making it too cheap for the safety and advantage of all concerned. This is just what has been done for the last few years during which we have had the maximum of risks with the minimum of rates, and the result has been, as the history and statistics of fire insurance since the war will show, that the business has become unremunerative, and has been gradually transferred from the strong companies, which had nothing to gain and everything to lose, to the weak ones, which had everything to gain and but little to lose while the former have been steadily curtailing their risks and limiting their operations to the best property of their own immediate surroundings, the latter, through their agents, have been scattering their policies broadcast throughout the country without proper discrimination as to the character of their risks. Many of these expanded companies, with small capital and no surplus, have been swept away by this great calamity while the solid ones, which refuse to enter into cheap competition with them, for the most part stand firm as a rock. The dear-bought experience of hundreds of ruined policyholders upon this occasion will probably teach them that the cheapest is not always the best, and that our fire insurance system, in order to be efficient, and to practically afford that protection to the community which it professes to guarantee, must be established on a sound and strong foundation. Property holders cannot expect such sure protection unless they are willing to pay a fair price for it, and by encouraging that cheap competition among insurance agents, which is manifestly incompatible with a safe and legitimate business, they only repel and restrict the sphere of those conservative and prudent institutions which alone are trustworthy and capable of performing what they promise in such emergencies as the present. THE DUTY OF THE HOUR Whatever other effects may follow the recent disaster at Chicago, there is one result which must come from this calamity, as matter of vital necessity both for the agents and for the companies they represent. The rates of premium must be advanced at once to a paying point and by means of concerted action on the part of all agents everywhere. We doubt not the agents' recognition of this necessity, nor their disposition to meet it. But action, not theory, is what is wanted, and they should not lose a moment in profiting by the public engrossment with insurance matters, 
to organize themselves in a solid phalanx against a relapse of insurance interests into the old channels of ruinous competition. Widespread as is this disaster, and seriously as it has crippled a number of companies, it is a subject of pride that in the great majority of cases losses will be promptly settled. And when the facts and figures are finally spread out in authentic form, we may expect a reaction in favor of insurance and its promoters, such as will astonish even its most ardent friends. Few companies have failed as regards their policyholders, and those which have suffered heavy loss will reorganize at once, with less financial capital, perhaps, but with a reserve of moral capital and honorable prestige, which will make their policies worth more than ever before. It is the duty of agents, as men who in prosperous times have reaped the largest share of the harvest, to come promptly to the help of the companies at this juncture, and this they can do by immediately taking steps to make the public realize the value of insurance and the difference between sound and cheap policies. Already in many cities and towns the rates have been advanced to an adequate standard. Rates should be immediately doubled everywhere in the United States. End of section 1